Hello, and welcome to this edition of Live from NORLAB at Kit Peak. I am your host, Rob Sparks, with our moderator, Jamika Marshall. Today, Connie Walker and Jeff Hall will talk about satellite constellations and the industrialization of space, and I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say about this interesting topic. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you need to type them in the chat box, and we will relay them to our guests. First, I'd like to tell you about Kit Peak uh, National Observatory. Kit Peak is funded by the National Science Foundation and is a NOR lab facility. It was founded in 1958 and is located on land uh, leased from the Tana Otham Nation. We are indebted to the Otham for letting us use one of their sacred mountains for astronomical research. Kit Peak is home to over 25, uh, two dozen tel optical telescopes and two radio telescopes as well. I always start with a little news item here. And I'd like to start with this image that was recently used from Sext of Sexton B. This star-studded image shows the irregular gal galaxy Sextons B, which lies about 4.5 million light years from Earth at the edges of the local group. Total mass around 200 million times the mass of the sun, Sexton B hosts an intriguing variety of astronomical objects. Some of the most conspicuous, you can see those ruby red clouds of atomic hydrogen visible near the center of this image. These vast glowing clouds are giving birth to brilliant new stars. Supernova and the stellar winds from these young stars will eventually sweep aside, the, sweep aside the cool clouds of hydrogen, leaving behind clusters of stars with similar ages and properties. As well as stellar birthplaces, Sextons B harbors the sites of stellar death. Sextons B is one of the smallest galaxies known to contain several planetary nebula, though they're not visible in this image. Planetary nebula are the outermost layers of aging red giant stars thrown out into space at the end of a star's life. In addition to Sexton B and its contents, this image features both very distant objects and stars much closer to home. Far away galaxies can be seen littering the background of this image, noticeable by their fuzzy appearances or irregular shapes. Meanwhile, bright stars from our own galaxy shine in the foreground. Several of the bright nearby stars are surrounded by conspicuous diffraction spikes, prominent crisscross patterns created by light interfering with the structure of a telescope. This image is available on the, our website, noirlab.edu, in the image gallery for download free in a variety of sizes. So if you like this image and think it'd make a good back on your computer, you can make that happen. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have two speakers today who are going to talk about this topic. Connie Walker has been a scientist at NSF's Noir Lab for almost 20 years, creating with the CEE team, Communications Education and Engagement team, innovative programs on dark skies education, astronomy, optics, and sharing them via workshops, talks, and events in Tucson, Arizona, the United States, and all over the world. She's also been involved with light pollution issues on the ground since 2002, and in space, which is what we're talking about today, since 2019. Besides Noir Lab, she has leadership roles in dark and quiet skies protection and national and international astronomical associations, the American Astronomical Society and the International Astronomical Union, and in the world-renowned Dark Sky, Sky Association, IDA, the International Dark Sky Association. Connie co-chaired, in partner with Jeff Hall, our other speaker, a couple of workshops on dark skies and the impact of satellite constellations on astronomy last year, and will be co-chairing their sequels this year. Our other speaker, Jeff Hall, is director of Lowell Observatory. He has a BA in physics from Johns Hopkins and a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from Penn State. He joined the staff at Lowell in 1992 as a postdoctoral research fellow specializing in optical spectroscopy and the variations of sun and sun-like stars. He is presently the chair of the AAS Committee on Light Pollution, Radio Frequency Interference, and Space Debris. His principal avocation is music. He is a substitute organist at Epiphany Episcopal Church in Flagstaff and former president of the board of directors of Flagstaff Symphony Orchestra. So at this point, I will stop sharing the screen and I'd like to bring on Connie and Where Hey, good afternoon, good evening, and good e uh, good night for those of the, from other parts of the world. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Also, you're breaking up. Oh wow, you're breaking up very badly. Okay, I'm sorry. I can't do anything about that at this point. Uh, that might hopefully it, hopefully it doesn't hopefully it comes back soon. Okay. I'll start sharing screen, it looks like. Okay, okay, super, now I'll meet out. All right. Well, once again, everybody, thank you very much, especially Rob and Jamika for inviting Jeff and I to talk a bit about the challenge of the, uh, to the field of astronomy that uh, satellite constellations and the industrialization of space has presented. Uh, most of the satellite constellations impacting astronomy are, are ones that have broadband internet access. And for instance, uh, 
this broadband internet access to especially places like rural areas that potentially need it for health issues is, is extremely important. Uh, while that is very important to address things like that at the process to address them should not necessarily cause the impact to astronomy or the loss of the science. Uh, dealing with astronomy. So one analogy that drives it home uh, is, uh, is the challenge at hand uh, is for sort of like the invention of plastics to take, for example. The benefits uh, of plastics to society uh, seem to be immense at first, like so beneficial. Uh, however, plastics were mass produced and marketed before we really had a handle on how they were gonna affect our environment and what we could do to address uh, that. And so astronomers working with uh, various stakeholders like the satellite operators are not asking the satellite companies to not launch or, <laughs> or not have this beautiful, wonderful, beneficial broadband internet service, but they are, um, well, for instance, through workshops we had last year, we identified how satellites together with the satellite uh, operators, we identify how these satellites are impacting astronomy and what ways we might be able to mitigate those impacts. Um, and what we're asking now is that uh, all stakeholders together take a look at ways to feasibly implement those strategies and to minimize uh, the impacts before the conditions become unfixable like they were for plastics basically. Uh, so today you're gonna hear more about uh, astronomy, uh, how astronomy is impacted and the proposed solutions to the impact and some of the next steps. And with that, I'd like to hand it over for the next slide to, to Jeff. Okay, thanks Connie. And thanks everyone for joining us and to the folks at uh, NORLAB, Rob, Jamika, thank, thanks for having me. Um, always happy to be on and, and talk about this, this interesting topic. Um, Connie referred in the first slide to the industrialization of space. And this is, this is really the sort of the watershed era we are at right now. For uh, a long time, space has been the realm of massive national level projects like the Apollo program and, and you know, fairly uh, large targeted programs. But now we are in an era where increasingly access to space through quick, nimble private sector companies with vision and resources and, and the business model to make it work is, is suddenly there. And we are seeing now companies building reusable rockets. And, and so, so things are changing rapidly in the space environment. And this is creating a perfect storm for ground-based astronomy. And we're seeing that change happen in a number of different directions. First of all, as Connie will talk about in a bit, just the sheer quantity of satellites. You know, right now, you, you, you we're all familiar with seeing satellites going by after sunset. You know, the ISS, HST are well-known, really bright ones. There's actually only about 200 of those initially that are visible to the unaided eye and only a few thousand active and a few more thousand dead satellites, some tens of thousands of pieces of space junk. All of a sudden, we're looking at an enormous potential quantity of satellites in low Earth orbit. Just from the companies uh, having done initial filings, the full, you know, if demand warranted, the full build out could be many tens of thousands, just like that, a, a, a sudden increase in, in the sheer number of satellites. Some of them, uh, these constellations are slated to fly fairly high, and, and Connie will be talking about this uh, and, and our conclusions about where it's most beneficial to astronomy to have constellations fly, but, but increasingly different layers of orbit are going to be heavily populated with satellites. One thing that really got this whole conversation started after the initial Starlink launch was the brightness. The satellites were so bright, uh, it surprised, I think, ground-based optical astronomers. It surprised SpaceX. They were just incredibly bright, the, the string of pearls going across the sky at about third magnitude in their parking orbits, third to fourth, which is, it's about the same as a medium bright visible eye star, even on station, seventh to ninth magnitude, which is not visible to the unaided eye, but massively bright to a research telescope worth any bit of its salt. And finally, there's what I sometimes call the wild, the new wild west. Uh, there's very little regulation in place up there. The regulation that is in place is quite old at this point. There's nothing in place to stop an operator who just didn't care 
about their impact on the environment of the night sky from launching a constellation of several thousand visible eye satellites. You could you just go do it if you had the resources and the business model and the, the technology to do it. So all of a sudden we're at this watershed moment and, and we've been working to try to address it. And Connie's gonna go into some details on all of this in the next slide. Well, actually, Jeff, you did an excellent job. It won't be too much more detail, but anyway, <laughs> here goes. Oh, so, so there are a few principal factors as, as we went over in the last slide uh, of impact on astronomical observations from satellite constellations. And the, the first, as Jeff mentioned, is the, is the visible satellites. Um, uh, there's, you know, he mentioned the international and the national regulatory filings. They indicate that tens of thousands of these satellites will be launched in the next decade. And that's gonna have an extreme impact both visually to the you know to uh, the general populace and also to the astronomical um, research that we do on the various telescopes. So that pretty much means that maybe up to five thousand satellites could be present overhead at any particular observatory around the world, and, and this has a you know incredible consequences. We're going to go into a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Um, uh, the second factor is the orbital altitude of the satellites and their density, you know, how many are in a particular area will be greatest at low elevation during uh, and during twilight hours, especially. But this is where a lot of incredible um, science goes on. For, for instance, uh, the ones for, for near-Earth asteroids and the protection of the Earth from near-Earth asteroids. Right? That's just one instance. But, um, but increasing their orbital altitude to over 600 kilometers will actually increase their visibility all night long because they are in the sunlight for, for um, more of the night, the higher in altitude you go. So uh, if you are, you know, you, you, it's, it's less chance to be in Earth's shadow, basically, the higher the altitude you are for satellites. And uh, the third factor is the brightness. Uh, and, and, you know, I think, you know, Jeff, you did a great job. I don't need to say too much more, but, but without mitigation, without uh, strategies that we all can take in hand, both the astronomers and the uh, satellite operators and satellite manufacturers, uh, the apparent brightness of satellites could could, and it will saturate the pixels of many telescope detectors, especially ones like the Rubin uh, uh, Observatory. Uh, the uh, instrumentation they have on there is a beautiful uh, camera that they have. And that, uh, as I'll tell you a little bit later, will be will saturate maybe a third of their, every image will have, every third image will have at least one satellite streak in it, for instance. Um, so this is something to really, consider uh, seriously and to try to deal with. And then to date, like uh, Jeff so eloquently stated, um, there are there is a lack of regulation. It is the Wild West out there right now. Um, and uh, we need to really, we've been trying actually at, at an international level and at a national level, we're gonna try even harder to try to create somehow, it, the path is kind of hard to, to, to determine, but to, to figure out how to regulate uh, um, well, how to introduce regulations that would mitigate this problem, basically. So um, there have been two workshops that we have done in the past year. Um, so let me give you some, some preface to all this. Um, in in <laughs> May of 2019, uh, I think a lot of astronomers' jaws dropped, basically, at the site of 60 um, Starlink satellites being launched uh, together. Um, and, uh, you know, as Steph said, uh, forming a, what could be construed as a beautiful string of pearls in the night sky, but not so much to astronomers. And so our jaws were dropped and we uh, started talking with, thanks to the American Astronomical Society, uh, started talking with SpaceX each month thereafter uh, since the launch in May, 2019. 19, and we decided uh, after about a half a year of doing that to have a special session actually at, at our annual meeting, the national meeting of the Astronomy uh, Society. Um, and it would be dedicated to addressing the impact of satellite constellations on astronomy. And we invited SpaceX to be one of our 
four presenters and they were gracious enough to accept and they did a great job. And we, the best part of it all is that we got to know them and their culture a little bit better. And they got to know our culture a little bit better and to know what we were asking and to the comfort level uh, actually got, got better. It was raised between the cultures. And so um, as a result at that meeting in January of 2020, the National Science Foundation actually said, hey, you know what? we think it'd be a good idea for you to have some workshops on this topic. Uh, we, would, we wouldn't mind funding you a little bit for this. And we were uh, really, uh, you know, we really took that, out of, you know, we, we made that happen basically last year. And about a half a year after that, in July or end of June, July, 2020, we had our first satellite constellation workshop, SATCON 1. And the, the reports are downloadable as you see here uh, on this particular, um, uh, slide. And then below that, we had actually a second meeting because the International Astronomical Union, which is the, I, I, I kid, and I say the uber lord of all astronomical societies, but it's it's just, it's an association for all astronomers worldwide. Um, um, they, uh, they were actually requested by the United Nations to hold a dark and quiet skies on science and society conference. And you know, COVID got in the way and stuff like that. But we still decided to have an online workshop. And and you know, since the point of the request, we had this happenstance with uh, the satellite constellations. So that became part of the conference as well. And it gave really pushed the uh, gave us impetus to hold the um, whole conference last October. And uh, so it was online due to COVID. And um, and the links again are here on this page at the bottom of the slide. Uh, both workshops will have sequels this year, SATCON 2 and the Dark and Quiet Skies uh, for Science and Society Conference will be, uh, the, the, the latter of the two will be in person and online, whereas SATCON 2 will be basically online. Okay, so, Jeff? Oh, I guess, am I saying this one? I guess I am, sorry about this. Um, almost all type of astronomical observations will be uh, affected. And I'm talking about the science now. There's a whole litany or list of science uh, in astronomy that is affected different areas uh, from extragalactic to uh, exoplanets, but uh, almost all types will be affected. But uh, the most deeply affected will be things like the wide field. That means, you know, you can see a big area with a telescope, extragalactic imaging on, uh, on uh, will be affected. So it could be anything that deals with uh, extragalactic imaging with, with telescopes that are like the Rubin Observatory that's gonna come online early in 2023. And also the second thing that's most deeply affected are things like the near earth asteroids I mentioned briefly before. Uh, so the brightness of the satellite trails makes it difficult if not impossible to remove those trails from the image using some post-processing software. So it's gonna be estimated that uh, 30 to 40% of the images taken by a wide field telescope like the Rubin Observatory will be adversely impacted. And, um, and of course, as I mentioned, also a variety of asteroid um, warning networks worldwide will be deeply affected as well. And so, and this image here, I just wanna mention is done by a colleague of ours, uh, Peter Yoakum, who's associated with the Rubin Observatory. And he did this as part of the work in our working groups uh, for the SATCON 1 workshop. And this was um, a simulation of uh, trails of almost 48,000 LEO satellites over a 10 minute period, as would be seen from the Rubin Observatory. And all those yellowish areas are the trails. And you can see how dense they are near the horizon and the zenith being right basically in the middle of the plot. And the only part of the horizon that is not affected is actually the part that's in earth shadow basically. And you see that as the navy blue part. So I just wanna bring that to your attention. So it's, it's a concern and that's just in a 10 minute, 10 minute period. Okay, Jeff, here you go. <laughs> yep, yep, my turn now. <clears throat> okay, and, and just, I, we, I, I think we both, we both tend to throw out acronyms just really quickly just to make sure everybody understands when we say LEO, I do it all the time too. Low yeah. Earth orbit, that which is this this area of space right around Earth. You know, it's not where things like, you know, the weather satellites and GPS satellites they live much higher up. These this is this is low orbital zone of this 500 to 1200 kilometers 
uh, where the satellites are low and fairly bright. Um, so Connie mentioned the SATCON 1 workshop. Uh, we certainly appreciate um, NSF for having the idea and, and funding us to do it and, and NARLAB for, for hosting. Um, I, it was a very interesting uh, four days of discussion last June. And then what we did after the conclusion of the workshop, then the working groups went back to work and refined their reports. And we wrote that summary, um, which you can download um, the, the full, the main report is, I, what was it? It was only about 25 pages and, and it's written to be, you know, accessible pretty much to anybody, policymakers, you know, people who are interested in this issue. Then you can also download the full working group reports, which is more like 150 pages. And that's got all of the technical details that the working groups went into. But what came out of it, you'll see if you download that report, is a set of 10 recommendations. And they divide it neatly into three different categories. Uh, we have some recommendations that observatories are gonna to need to take on, and you can see them listed here, basically improvements in the software tools and the impacts of, of, of trying to correct the images for satellite trails, uh, do that better than we are currently able to do right now, um, uh, more efficiently, more systematically. In this image here, which is from uh, Tony Tyson with the Rubin Observatory, Tony was uh, the chair of one of the SATCOM-1 working groups. And he has also been working very closely with SpaceX under a non-disclosure agreement so that he can see technical details and work with them closely on, on mitigating uh, the design of their satellites. So you can see here some of the problems that Connie was referring to in uh, the previous slide where satellite trails become impossible to fix and the, the brightest diagonal trail across this image is saturated and, and you know you can't you can't recover from that the, the data there has been lost but you see all these additional trails which are sort of induced by crosstalk and the, the the electronics from this very bright central trail and you can see all the the discontinuities and and the, the fact that there are several of them um, when you apply software fixes to mask these things out or, or remove them you know how do you do it uniformly how do you know you're not compromising the data below you know can can, can the scientific community trust um, the data and then a, a facility like Rubin is going to produce this this watershed of data it's petabytes of data and, and this incredible number of images, are those going to be reduced consistently? How do we develop the tools and the practices so that you don't have kind of a, a Tower of Babel with everybody reducing data a little bit differently? And how do you intercompare the, the, the results? It's a very thorny problem and a tremendous uh, at present unfunded mandate that we're, we're going to have to deal with as the number of satellites um, increases. So that falls on the observatories. Um, I should mention that SpaceX um, was a very active participant in SATCOM 1, as uh, and it, there were representatives from Amazon and OneWeb there as well. And so we also developed recommendations for the satellite operators. Those are on the next slide. Oh, sorry. And so the, the recommendations here were to encourage the satellite operators, you know, let, let's not get surprised again with a really incredibly bright launch of 60, design the satellites from the ground up, knowing they have the potential to be this bright. How do you de develop them and design them uh, out of the gate for minimum reflectance? Um, we did uh, arrive at a, a concrete recommendation for how bright the satellites need to be. Um, and, fainter than a visible magnitude, V magnitude of 7.0. And that's a, it's actually a slightly more complicated equation depending on how high the satellite is. But what you get here is um, you're still gonna have saturated trails, but you get the, the subsidiary trails down to the point where they can be removed. And an advantage of seven is it's also just below the visibility of the most eagle-eyed human observer. And as, as Connie put it very well, you know, this is a, a, a significant impact on astronomy, but there are multiple other uh, impacts in terms of, of uh, degradation of the night sky. Um, and, you know, lots of people probably don't want 5,000 new stars moving around up there. So, so having the satellites not visible to the naked eye is, is certainly part of it. Um, we also want to avoid things like iridium flares. So we want to minimize specular reflection in the direction of, observ of observatories to prevent these, these very bright and somewhat unpredictable uh, glints. 
Okay, and so then finally, um, we had a set of recommendations. Next slide for operators where ast operators in astronomy are going to need to work um, collaboratively. You know, it's obviously it's it's beneficial um, if in the parking orbits um, the the operators can clump those as tightly as possible so they're spread out over as small a region of sky as possible. Sort of a corollary to that is. We also encourage the operators to orbit raise and deorbit as rapidly as they can, so that this very bright uh, du the duration of this very bright phase of, of orbits is, is minimized. Um, we will need a much more comprehensive database of observations of just how bright these things actually are, so we can better understand, you know, what mitigations are working, what are not working, you know, what's going on that's counterintuitive. You know, it, it, a satellite might somehow be brighter even if it's farther away, depending on its its uh, geometry and its attitude, and and you know, questions of what's the elevation versus what's the range. There's lots of complicated variables in here. Um, this is a great area for citizen scientists to get involved because the equipment readily available to amateur astronomers is more than up to the task. Uh, you, you know, for a very reasonable investment, you can get really nice equipment these days. That's more up more than up to the task of doing uh, very. Uh, precise and comprehensive satellite observations. Uh, there was a lot of interest in that expressed from the SATCON 1 attendees, many of them, many of whom were citizen scientists. I, and we need to improve both positional information and um, the satellite orbit definitions, which in the biz we call the TLEs or two line elements. It's basically a little, a, a little string of characters that identifies the satellite and gives you its orbital elements. Um, we, we need them to be more accurate than they are, which, which stems from the small fields of view of a lot of our, our telescopes. You know, if your field of view is this big and you know your, your positional axis on the satellite is that big, you don't really know when it's going to be where. And, and it's actually a substantial improvement that we need. This isn't the, the operators being careless or anything. They've just been working with the, the parameters they need, but, but we need a, a little bit higher accuracy. So those are kind of the 10 recommendations that came out in the SATCON 1 workshop. Um, and now I think Connie is going to sort of talk about what are we going to do now? Because it's it's fine to make recommendations, but then as often happens, recommendations can get put on a shelf like lots of strategic plans and, and then they get forgotten. So how are we actually going to make progress? And, and I think Connie is going to go into that a little bit. OK. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there are, it's like having a, a multi-pronged fork. You have uh, one uh, of the prongs is basically uh, what we've been doing with the workshops. And, you know, another prong would be basically the citizen science we can do and talking with the public and getting them involved. And the third prong is what I start off the slide with, which is basically working on an international level and seeing um, what can be done in terms of starting some sort of regulations along these lines. And th those wheels turn very slowly. <laughs> um, so, but, but on April 21st, just this past April 21st, on behalf of the International Astronomical Union, I was lucky enough to be asked to present a technical paper from the Dark and Quiet Skies workshop. But that also interweaves with the results from SATCON 1. And, and my colleague, Piero Benvenuti, presented on a summary paper to that particular Dark and Quiet Skies conference. And we presented this to a, a subcommittee at the United Nations called the Science and Technology Subcommittee. It was their meeting, basically, we were at. And this committee uh, is made up of 95 member states from the UN, right? Um, all delegates must agree by consensus, not just a vote, it has to be consensus to whatever items you propose. So we presented close to 80 recommendations basically from um, a lot of different topics that included the satellite constellations. And a quarter of these recommendations were on specifically the satellite constellations. And that's what drew everybody's attention. They sort of didn't pay attention to anything else but what was on uh, for the satellite constellations, which was amazing. And we were very encouraged by what they said uh, in the end. And, uh, and they, they encouraged us and sanctioned us to actually continue our research. 
uh, with the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. It's actually called the Office of Outer Space Affairs. And, um, and, uh, <laughs> and continue, especially with this conference that we're planning for October on dark and quiet skies. Uh, and then report back to them next year, same time, same channel sort of thing uh, at the Science and Technology uh, Subcommittee. Uh, with the uh, implementation uh, of mitigation measures that we start working, you know, actually try to start implementing in this year. So uh, that's the update from the international side. We're going to be doing things like uh, what they call a working paper to the next meeting of the COPOS, which is the Committee of the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, which falls under it's getting into too much detail, but anyways, it falls under uh, the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs. And uh, they're gonna meet in August and we have to kind of get them apprised because if, you, if we come in a year's time back with more information, they're gonna say, what? This is the first time we've heard about this. So we have to be very judicious about keeping them informed. Uh, but the parallel track that I'd like to emphasize actually is the two workshops or basically the second one is actually a conference. We're gonna have this year again, like last year, it's gonna be SACCON 2. And again, this is on focusing on the uh, implementations of the recommendations we came up with basically last year. We're gonna concentrate on the observation side and the algorithms of the software uh, side on policy and uh, on involving more of the stakeholders, as many of the stakeholders as we can possibly involve because it affects everybody and we want everybody to have a voice. So that's the emphasis there. And then we have for the Dark and Quiet Skies Conference, again, uh, emphasizing on much of the same uh, as, as the SACCON too, but on an international level, basically. Uh, so that's the, the uh, steps forward, I would say, uh, next. Can I jump in here with a question from our YouTube audience? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, this definitely is something that many people are aware of. It's certainly in uh, part of our national dialogue for, for a while now. Uh, so when you all were talking about uh, how regular everyday citizen scientists can, could participate, uh, Jeff, could you clarify how we can do that? Or is there some place you can um, direct us to? I'm so sorry, my neighbors are outside with their kids. I apologize. <laughs> um, and uh, is there a, a, a link you can refer us to or where can we find out more information about how regular everyday people can start to track these satellites and get data so we can uh, help, help uh, be aware of where they are? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we can both speak to it. Um, you know, we had some citizen scientists at the SATCON 1 workshop. And, you know, as, first of all, you can start by contacting our committee. I mean, if you're interested in participating in this, we are looking for citizen scientists. In fact, we had a couple contact us after that. So we will have our contact information, Connie and I both, at the end of this talk. Um, Maybe, uh, Connie, maybe you could also speak a little bit to the, the proposed e-institute, which is another way that we're thinking about trying to connect, uh, allow people to connect. Yes, um, we're gonna be announcing at the end of SACCON 2, an e-institute, an online institute by which we can uh, continue the efforts of, of uh, the 40 people in the United States that have contributed to SACCON 1, and then probably at least, at least that many that will contribute to SACCON 2. But we also have simultaneously on an international level, uh, the International Astronomical Union is actually creating a center specifically for satellite constellations. And uh, that's gonna be announced shortly in the next few months and applications will be um, requested from, from uh, institutions around the world to apply to be the center. So that's uh, excellent too. So there with our dark and quiet skies, we had about 85 people from around the world involved in uh, creating the report that you see, you've seen online here. So, um, but we'd like, to, you know, we wanna be open and we want to have more people involved like citizen scientists, especially in this next, um, next round of, <laughs> of workshops. And one thing too, that you may not know uh, is that NASA has early on has gotten involved with a citizen science program and it's called a satellite streak watcher, I believe. 
uh, you can probably Google it and, and with those words, find it online. And they have asked citizen scientists to, to uh, try to um, log when they do see a street across the sky, you know, uh, at least the time and the, and the location. I'm not sure about the uh, exactly where in the sky, but where you are at least. Um, but uh, so that's something that can help as well. And I think um, literally taking photographs in the future, having a repository for that would be something to consider as well. So um, with that, I'll turn that back over to Jeff. Is that, are you done? Yep, I or, hope that answers it, yeah. yeah. It okay. did, that's perfect. Thank you both. Um, and we'll be sure to uh, add both of your contact info uh, in the video description at the end so that anyone interested in participating uh, can contact you. Excellent, thank oh, you. Wonderful, thank you, Jamika. Okay, so um, one of our last slides here, I wanted to show you that hot off the press is the poster for this uh, SACCON 2 workshop that, I, that both Jeff and I have mentioned. And this again will be held the week of July 12th. And the poster, I have to give kudos to our colleague, Pete Marenfeld from Noir Lab for creating this beautiful poster. Thank you, Pete. Uh, we will be addressing again, how to implement the mitigations to the impact of satellite constellations on astronomy and focusing on including a variety of stakeholders, including the satellite companies, space law policy people, <laughs> indigenous cultures, uh, just to name a few, it'll be you know, citizen scientists, um, so the, the general public, and we hope all of you will join us. And uh, the link is shown in the poster. And that link is right now the announcement, but on June 1st or thereabout, that same link will connect you to the website where you can find out how to register, basically. Uh, so with that, let me see if Connie? I can. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Who's able to, um, Connie and Jeff, uh, who's able to register for this workshop, SATCON 2? Well, I think uh, anybody with a keen interest. Uh, we, we are uh, looking for people who will contribute to the conversation that we have during the workshop. Uh, we are also actually soliciting right now on the announcement page, uh, a registration form for people who wanna be part of the working groups. But that, that really, uh, and anyone can do that, but you have to really contribute to the working group. It's, a, it's, it's just a, it's a bona fide working group. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. Go the ahead, situation Jeff. is urgent. We're trying to move along. The working groups have about eight weeks, and it's going to be eight pretty intense weeks uh, mm -hmm. coming up with, with evaluating their charges. But, you know, one of those working groups is community engagement because a specific mm -hmm. goal of SATCON 2 is to get this discussion beyond astronomy and the satellite operators. We want to include citizen scientists and people who may not have had their voices at the table, you know, underrepresented communities, you know, indigenous communities who use the sky for many purposes. Um, you know, they need to be at the table and, and you know, not, not necessarily that that goes one way or the other, you know, very remote communities can benefit from access, but, you know, they also can treasure the night sky. So where, where are the, the balances there? So yeah, follow that and feel free to sign up. That's fantastic uh, that uh, regular people can attend and even possibly contribute. Thank you both for clarifying that. And we have another question from our YouTube audience, Alan Jackson. Um, our question here is, um, so Jeff mentioned the orbital parameters for each uh, satellite. Are they called TLEs? And does a NDA need to be signed to obtain them? No, those are those are publicly accessible. Um, yeah, two line elements, right? And and yeah, you know, I've got this this awesome little satellite tracker app on my phone, you know, and it 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 downloads the data. And so 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 yeah, those are publicly accessible, and the satellite companies actually have been very proactive in making sure we we know exactly where to get to the currently available positional information for their fleets. Yeah. No, the NDA comes in when you're like, and to be clear, Connie and I are not working uh, on the NDA side of things. We've been working with SpaceX, but sort of on the other side of that dividing line. The NDA is where they are sharing their proprietary design information so that Tony Tyson and others can really understand how to model the brightness and the impacts. 
But then again, you can't you can't say anything to other people. So that's right. where the right. non, non-disclosure comes in. Yeah, since but, we're not under the NDA, we can do shows like this. And I don't have to worry about accidentally doing something that's going to get me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Sign your life away. Yeah. Um, you know, another one of the companies is uh, that you can, uh, well, web pages you can go to to find out about TLEs is Celeste Track. So if you want to go to celestrack.com, is it, Jeff? Okay. Yeah, that's one of the, Google the web pages. Okay, yeah, Google I'll check it out. Celeste <laughs> Track. Okay. Celeste Track. Celeste Track. All right, we'll do that. Thank you so much. I'll drop that in the in the chat. This is a fascinating topic. Fascinating cool. topic. Thank you. All right. Um, so as we said up at the start, you know, and we're we're going to wrap up here and take any any final questions. This this is a watershed era for the nighttime sky, and I don't just mean 2021. Really, the past couple of decades. Because it was a couple of decades ago that fairly abruptly, you know, LEDs became viable uh, for outdoor lighting. And, you know, what most communities do when they convert a legacy system like high pressure sodium to LED is just sw switch them out and use bright, white, reasonably high temperature LEDs. Lumen for lumen, a white LED will increase the sky glow relative to a high pressure sodium lumen at least 50%, perhaps a factor of two, three, or five, depending on the type of LED and the type of light it's replacing. An enormous impact on, on ground-based um, light pollution. And it's a very similar thing as, as Connie was saying before, you, 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 you know, the argument don't launch satellites is a non-starter from square one. Don't switch to LED is likewise a non-starter. There are compelling reasons to do it and actually very smart things you can do with LEDs with direction and reducing the total lumen budget and therefore, and, and thereby, by the way, reducing the cost to implement the system. Uh, Tucson is a poster child for how you do that with white LEDs. Flagstaff, where I live, will be using amber LEDs this, this sort of advocacy is ongoing and imperative as we, as we work to protect the night sky from the ground. And now, within the past couple of years, this watershed era has also started from the top down as, as the satellites proliferate. Um, the, the, the TLDR here is um, we really appreciate SpaceX. You know, they, they don't regulatorily have to do anything, but they have invested a lot of time and money and effort in a very sincere attempt to lower the brightness of their satellites as much as they possibly can. There's still gonna be a substantial impact on ground-based astronomy. There's no way around that, but you know you have to give them credit for the effort and, and a very sincere engagement. And, and I also should say Amazon and OneWeb are getting engaged. And I hope that what we're doing here is setting a precedent because these aren't the only three companies in the world and broadband internet isn't the only space-based application for satellites. There are other companies in the United States and around the world that don't necessarily have to do anything the United States says or wants. So we, we want to set a, a precedent for collaboration between astronomy and industry and many other stakeholders that will lead us in a good direction going forward. So it's a very important time to be involved. And I certainly encourage any of the viewers who want to get involved and get interested and sign up for SETCON2 to go for it and, and join the conversation. All right, back to Connie. OK. Um, so OK, sorry. So we just want to mention, I think, Jeff, you were going to mention this one. I'll mention the next one. Oh, is this? Yeah. So these are the links. We can probably drop these into the chat um, of where you can get um, the, the SATCON 1 report, um, and that's the cover from it. Again, another, another excellent creation by Pete Marenfeld. Um, and and our, our article in the BAAS, which is the Bulletin of the American Astronomical Society. And all these are just online, free downloads. Go get them. Okay. Oops. I'll be sure to drop those links. I have a few links in the chat already, um, Connie and Jeff, just from uh, what I saw on your slides. Yeah. But uh, certainly um, at the end, before we post the recording, I'll be sure that uh, to grab all the links from your presentations and put them in the video description. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, there's one more set. <laughs> oh, all right. We're all right. right. Just <laughs> So whereas the, the previous slide was on the SATCON 1 uh, reports and article, basically, this is on the dark quiet skies, that second 
workshop last year in October. And there's the short version, which got presented to the UN that you see on the left. And there's a long 279 page report <laughs> on the right. <laughs> Your yep. choice. <laughs> if you're gluttons for punishment, there's a lot of downloads from this show. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there you go. And it's an extremely uh, thoughtful report. And again, uh, of all the working groups and all the members in those working groups, we had to have consensus. We had people uh, from all three companies that uh, Jeff mentioned, OneWeb, Amazon, and SpaceX on, uh, on our various um, uh, working groups uh, that had to do with satellite constellations. And, um, and you know, it, and it, 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 we had to all agree <laughs> on what was going to go into this particular uh, report. So there you go. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, a work well done, I have to say. So with that, let's see if we can go on to our next slide. Um, I just, I think, Jeff, if you want to sign off. Our, our last slide. Yes. So, so we said, you know, <laughs> contact information. So Connie and I are both on the uh, AAS Light Pollution Radio Interference and Space Debris Committee. So we're constantly in touch with AAS and, and we are the co-chairs of SATCOM too. Um, so this is one way to get involved um, and stay in touch if you want to, to email us. Um, and you know we'll just keep plugging along and, and see what transpires. I think the outcome of SATCOM 2 should be very interesting. Um, the, the working groups we have charged for that are, are charged to examine the observations of satellites, the algorithms, how we develop some of that software, policy, which is a big one. How do we start reviewing regulatory frameworks and getting some ground rules in place up there, which I think would be beneficial not only to astronomy, but to operators. You don't wanna have you know, just complete chaos at, at 500 kilometers. And then there's this community engagement group, which is tasked to understand the full scope of the conversation and all of the impacts of, of this steady change that we're putting into the night sky. And you don't know what all those effects are. Just, I think Connie had a great analogy about the plastics. It's, you know, good, great, lots of cool stuff. I mean, it's, it, they brought us a lot of things, but you know, you have to uh, study the, the consequences of, of changing technology. So with that, I think we're, we're done and welcome any, Jamika, if there are any more questions in the chat, we're happy to answer them. Otherwise, thanks for your attention. Okay, so in the chat, we uh, don't have any more current questions, but of course we have um, multiple thanks and great presentation um, in the comments. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have uh, also some of our NORLAB colleagues, uh, Janice Harvey, Carolina Vargas um, here joining us. So we of course appreciate everyone tuning in uh, to our live from Neural Lab every week. And of course, especially appreciate all of our Neural Lab colleagues support um, on the show as well too. So uh, Jeff and Connie, as you are uh, moving into getting ready for a SATCON too, and hopefully you'll have uh, a lot of participation as you did before, what um, kinds of of, of topics coming up in the future related to, to satellites and putting up so many new bright stars, uh, so to speak, in the sky, do you see uh, potentially needing to be dealt with that you're not really addressing at the moment? Uh, I'd say Kessler syndrome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so debris. You know, we are, yeah. we are focusing very heavily on the impacts of the constellations to ground-based astronomy, particularly optical infrared, also radio, although you know, work with the radio community has been ongoing somewhat longer than it has in the OIR. Um, but yeah, you know, this is, you know, 500 kilometers is a fairly narrow shell of space. You got a lot of hardware in there. Um, you know, some hardware that's near and dear to astronomers is right up there too, not far from Sterling. And and yeah, the proliferation of objects leads to the real probability of debris cascades. And I mean, you've already seen that there's there have been collisions. Um, and in fact, if you look at the graph of, mm -hmm. of how many how much junk is there as a function of orbital elevation, there's this huge spike you know, where the Chinese destroyed their satellite and where Iridium ran into something else. And we've already had uh, a couple of avoidance episodes with Starlink itself. So that is a, a biggie. Um, you know, some of the members of our working groups have brought up issues of, you know, how do we, 
how do we manage the use of space? You, you, you know, as you're starting to use the moon, you know, what, what rights do you have to do what to the moon? And, you know, and, and um, so, so there, there, there are lots of things. And then, you know, if the satellites are visible to the unaided eye, you know, for instance, I mean, the National Park Service has, has taken the dark sky under its charge. It considers that part of the, the natural resource it is charged to protect in addition to the, the landscapes and, and vistas that they, that they manage. Um, so they're just all sorts of, of uh, uh, Connie, can you think of others? Um, well, that's a great summary. Okay, yeah. yeah. Could I just mention something? Uh, the Universe Today website just today published a story about the first collision avoidance maneuver between a Starlink satellite and one of Amazon's one web satellites. Right. Oh. That, that, that was just published earlier today. It came across one of my Google alert uh, streams or something. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can put that, put that in the chat too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, this yeah. takes I, coordination. I can add that to the YouTube chat right here. So I'm actually on the chat. So I'll add cool. that right there. Thanks, Rob. If you think about the potential there, that takes real coordination because you want one person to avoid and the other person to not, because if both people are trying to avoid, then nobody knows where everybody's going. So, so you want one satellite, I'm just gonna do my thing and the other one's gonna get out of the way. If that starts to happen just constantly, yeah, we're, we're headed down an interesting path. Ah, uh, and this goes back to the need to keep track of where the satellites are and uh, yeah, in a good way for citizen well, scientists to be able to, to contribute. To, certainly, to yeah, improved positions, but it also goes to, um, yeah, so improved positional uh, information is obviously to our benefit, but this is also where the regulations come in, you know, yep. because any operator right now could launch 20,000 satellites into exactly the same orbital altitude, right? They could say, we're going to 550. And there's going to be some some spread, of course, but it could get really crowded. Connie, you have a comment? Well, if they have the uplinks and downlinks that they want to do within the United States, then you have to go through the FCC. But, but still, you know, and it has to get approval and it's a, a bit of a process, but but usually it does get approved, to be honest with you. And, uh, and they're not uh, in the United States either. No. And it, yeah, you have people from outside, like, Actually, Jeff had mentioned earlier that uh, don't are not going to be serving the United, United States at all, and they don't have to get any approval from the FCC. Uh, so there's, I mean, there's it is like the Wild West out there in a lot of ways because there's a lack of regulations. Ah, uh, so this leads into uh, a great segue into I think this uh, a question from. Uh, Liz Fleming from Memphis, Tennessee. So um, Liz asked. Uh, what do you, th oh, so she says, great show. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, what do you think the prognosis is for the U.S.'s program in the next 10 years? And, and maybe uh, she means um, the U.S.'s program to track uh, these satellites and to help with mitigation in the next 10 years. Well, there is an office that exists right now through the NSF that is a spectrum management office, but it really focuses solely on the radio. And they have been asked to start thinking about uh, the optical wavelengths, which is what, you know, visible wavelengths that we can see. And so it is the hope that the people in that office can focus on that uh, more intensely in the next few years so that we can actually have a, a, an organization that pays attention to those kind of things. Uh, and, and then there's, um, other aspects like uh, NEPA with the environmental concerns uh, might be an avenue to go through. We really don't have a pathway just yet within the United States. And that really does have to be created in some sense in order to um, make these regulations. Um, do you wanna to add to that, please? I, yeah, I just one comment. I think that, that summarizes it really well. Um, I think this is part of the, the prognosis is part of what SATCON2 will help to define right. um, because we have these recommendations from SATCON1, but what we really haven't done is taken a careful look at you know, developing this software tool or doing that mitigation. You know, how, how much people power does it take? How long is it gonna take? What's it gonna cost? You know, so, so I think SATCON2, I hope will start to give us a better handle on the, the 
the resource challenge that we're looking at to put some of these programs in place that will let us deal with this over the next decade. Yeah, yeah, the, the feasibility and actually that we're gonna to have to prioritize too because you can't always do everything. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone in our YouTube audience for uh, and our Facebook Live audience also. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and for uh, certainly in the YouTube chat. We appreciate your comments and questions as always. Uh, so to wrap up, Connie and Jeff, um, for everyday regular people who uh, may have uh, their their regular, their four inch, two inch telescope, their eight inch or 12 inch outside <laughs> in the night sky, they're getting ready to, to observe. Is there a possibility that just with our, our amateur uh, telescopes that like I would have, could, could those satellites actually uh, impact what we see with our four inch telescope? Absolutely. You know, because, um, you know, even on station, the satellites will be just below unaided eye visibility. So, you know, uh -huh. any amateur telescope or, or, you know, good pair of binoculars, you know, you are easily going to be down to the magnitudes that, that you'll see these on station. Um, and this is one reason that, you know, going back to Connie's point earlier, that we're telling everybody fly low because that really restricts the visibility, at least in the optical, to fairly shortly after sunset and shortly before sunrise. The constellations up at 1200 kilometers, you know, we've done the modeling for SATCOM 1, they're visible all night long in the summer at the latitude of Cerro Tololo. And so, you know, the facilities there, you know, the, 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 the Blanco, you know, Rubin, um, Gemini South, they're all right there and they're going to be impacted throughout the night if there are, you know, tens of thousands of satellites up there. So, so yeah, professional grade instruments and amateur telescopes, binoculars, at, right? Yeah. Now, a lot of these, these um, small telescopes have very small fields of view. And so that, of course, lowers the probability uh, as opposed to something like a Rubin. But still, yep, if it goes through, you're going to see it. Amazing. And I can show you just one thing, perhaps, if I can put yes. that on. Please do. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, uh, a key. Plot. Yep. Yeah. This plot here is it looks like you know, it looks Greek to me at first, but but uh, it actually shows you this is time on the x-axis here, going throughout the night from sunset to sunrise, and then uh, and then you have the satellites that might be at. Uh, the height or the altitude of 500 kilometers going across the night. And you can see that there, there are some periods, maybe four hours during the night. Uh, this is, uh, I don't have the specs on here, but this may be like the summertime at, uh, at the altitude, uh, the latitude of uh, Chile, where they have a lot right. of telescopes, major observatories. So you'll have maybe four hours a night where, yeah, you're not gonna have the satellites necessarily visible. But you can see, and this is the number of satellites, this is just for 10,000 satellites, it's not for 100,000. So this will be multiplied by a factor of 10. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you have, if you're at 1,000 kilometers, well, in the next 10 years, I should say. Uh, so if you're at 1,000 kilometers, there is no point during the night that you will not see satellites. They may go down by the time you get to midnight, but you'll still have, uh, for 10,000 satellites, if 10,000 are up there, you'll still have at least about, you know, 40 satellites as you can see uh, that may uh, go through your image that you're trying to take on the telescope. So that's that's the kind of analysis that was done in uh, the first SATCON uh, one workshop. Anything wow. to add to this? Um, nope, nope, that, that explains it. <laughs> wow. So anyways, yeah, so. That's perfect. That's Connie. Thank you for for sharing that again. That that's absolutely perfect. You know, and I as as we wrap up, I'm thinking about Charles Messier, right? The French comet hunter. Oh. We get our Messier objects from. What would he have thought about all of these satellite constellations? He'd have a very long Messier list. Of uh, Messier. And Ladies and gentlemen, the, the, first of all, the Messier marathon becomes a lot harder <laughs> when you have to get M eight hundred and seventy thousand. <laughs> That's a yeah, good that's... point, yeah. 
Well, wow. a lot easier because no matter where you point a telescope, you're going to get one of them. <laughs> you on your perspective. That's, I like that, Rob. I like that. Wow, this has just been a fantastic conversation. So, um, Liz Fleming, I, I hope that was uh, a good uh, answer for you. And again, thank you, everyone in the YouTube audience, for their comments and questions. Okay, back over to you, Rob. Okay, thank you very much, Connie and Jeff. That was fantastic. That was very interesting as always. Um, before we sign off, we uh, just a reminder, we always have our um, uh, live from Norlab here Wednesdays at 5 p.m., except for the chilly week. Uh, but next week, I believe it's Gemini's turn, right, Jamika? It is next week. Uh Right here on this channel, same time, Life of Noor Live at Hawaii, we will have as our guest, uh, Noor Lab Associate Scientist, Vinicius Placo. Um, he will be talking about a chemically peculiar star found from its colors. So uh, join us next Wednesday right here, same bat time, same bat channel <laughs> for that. Thank you, Rob. Sounds like an intriguing detective story you're going to be hearing next week. So anyway, I also just encourage everyone to watch the Norlab social media channels because I'm sure there will be a press a, a release of some type after SATCON 2 and the reports come out like there was with SATCON 1. So watch our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Norlab Astro. That's the same handle for all the channels for that. So thank you very much. And we'll sign off for this, week for this week's live from Norlab. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Aloha.